uh, because at some point you 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 had you had something like this, and in and then you wrote this, of course. But this works only if your f's have finite integrals. Okay, so you need to justify that beforehand. Say, well, now I know that they are in L one, so the difference is in L one too. Okay. So that's, that's why I took a point off. You, you need to be careful not to have infinity minus infinity. That's always the issue. OK, so let's go over the problems of this week. So in this case, you, you're told that your sequence Fn converges uniformly uh, to x. And you're told that your Fn are integrable and that your, uh, oh, OK. So you first need to do, you first need to, uh, to uh, so you, you want to, to show that uh, you can pass uh, uh, to the limit. Uh, but in order to do that, you need to explain why your f is integrable. Okay, and that's easy uh, because you can write your f as being f minus f n plus f n, and that's uh, less than f minus f n plus f n. And uh, because you know that your, uh, you have uniform convergence, you know that the supremum of fn of x minus f of x over all x's, this supremum is some number a n, and that number a n goes to 0, as n goes to infinity. So you first do the supremum, and then you let n go to infinity. So uh, what you do here is you write that this is less than a n plus f n, if you define a n to be like this. Because um, f minus f n for every x, so you, you have this inequality here for your function. Now, the, the thing is that uh, the integral of a n plus f n with respect to mu is the integral of a n with respect to mu plus the integral of f n with respect to mu. And, and when I have positive uh, numbers, functions, I don't have any trouble writing these things, because they, it can all be infinity, but it's well defined. OK, a n is a positive number. So now, when you integrate your a n, you get a n mu of x. And here it's crucial that we're assuming that mu of x is finite. OK? If it's infinite, then you get infinity here. And uh, you are smaller than something which is not integrable, which doesn't prove anything. OK? So this is a n plus mu of x plus this thing here. And you assume that this thing is finite. So the whole thing here is finite. Okay, and therefore uh, the integral of f d mu must be finite as well. Okay, you're smaller than something that has a finite integral. Therefore, this integral is finite as well, which means that your f belongs to L one of mu.
Okay, so that's the first step. And then second step, you want to show that the limit of the integral is actually zero. And uh, well, we we look at so what 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 are we asked to do exactly? Oh, okay. So we want to look at the difference between f and d mu and f d mu. And this is meaningful to do because we know now that we have finite numbers here and here. And this is less than the integral of fn minus f d mu, which is less than a n d mu. Okay, but you integrate a constant, you get a n mu of x. Okay, this is the simplest possible simple function. And that's how we have defined our integral of simple function. I take the constant and I do mu of one of a set. But because there is just one here, there is no set, it means that I'm integrating over all x. You see, this thing is a n times one x. So by using just the definition of the integral of a simple function, I get this. Okay? And this is finite. Uh, this is finite, and this goes to zero. This is a constant. So the product goes to zero. And we are done. Okay? So we can conclude that the integral of fn d mu converges to the integral of f d mu. Now, at several uh, different places, we have used the fact that we have a finite measure space. And uh, it's easy to come up with a counterexample when your space is not finite. Uh, so, for instance, you could do that your fn is the constant 1 over n. Okay? And that mu is the Lebesgue measure m. Uh, so, uh, fn, min fn converges to 0, of course, and if you look at fn, if you look at the supremum over all x's of so let's let's look at real numbers. Supreme of f of n x minus zero is exactly one over n, of course. So our a n is one over n, and a n goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So f n converges uniformly to zero. But the integral of fn respect to m on r is 1 over n measure of r. But the measure, the Lebesgue measure of r is infinity. Therefore, you get infinity. And the Lebesgue measure of zero is zero, of course. So this is not converging to this.
questions? Okay, number 20. So all the functions are in L1, so we don't need to worry about that. And then uh, we are given that Fn is less than Gn. And what we can do is imitate this, um, imitate the, the dominated convergence theorem by looking at, so we're going to look at Fn, uh, well, Gn plus Fn. That's going to be a positive function, and then we apply Fatou's lemma, and so we have that the Fn converges almost uh, everywhere, and so does Gn. So we can, so this side is simply the integral of F plus G. And this side is equal to, uh, so because we know that uh, the integral, okay, so this is lim inf of the integral of Fn plus the integral of Gn. We can do that because we have functions that are in L1. Okay? And then uh, what happens, and, and that's something we used already, but we didn't prove, is that uh, if An converges to A, uh, then lim inf of a n plus b n is a plus lim inf of b n. We have an inequality between lim inf, but it goes on the wrong side. So if we don't know that, we are in trouble. Okay. So we do that. This guy is equal to is equal to, uh, so the limit of, G, of the integral we are told is g, the integral of g, plus lim inf of the integral of fn. Okay, so uh, at the end of the day we have that the integral of f plus the integral of g is less than integral of g plus lim inf of fn. So the integrals of g cancel again because g is in L1 and so this is a finite number and we are left with integral of f less than lim inf of integral of uh, fn. And then we do the same thing with Gn minus Fn. Gn minus Fn must be positive as well. So we can apply Fatou's lemma to this sequence. So we do lim inf of Gn minus Fn equal to uh, G minus F. And by Fatou, this is less than 
lim inf of gn minus fn. So that's lim inf of uh, so again, we, we use the same fact which is there, which is that this is G plus lim inf of minus Fn, which is minus lim sub of the sequence of integrals. Uh, again, the, the, the integrals of G cancel, and we're left with so we are left with uh, minus integral of f less than minus mean sub of integral of f n. And we get that the lim sub is less than the integral of f. And we compare this to that. So by, by putting together our two inequalities, we get that the lim inf is bigger than the lim sub, which is only possible if they're equal. Okay? So we use the two inequalities. Okay, if we call this inequality 1 and this inequality 2, we can say that 1 plus 2 implies that lim inf of fn is equal to lim sub of fn, which implies that uh, this converges. And since our integral of f is sandwiched between the two, it must converge to the integral of f. Okay, by using the inequalities one and two again. So this was really very similar to uh, the proof of a dominated convergence theorem. Twenty-one. So first part, let's, let's show the direct implication. Uh, we're assuming that the integral of fn minus f goes to 0. And we want to show that the integral of the absolute values converge as well. Then we look at this. In this case, we are told that uh, all the functions are in L1. Okay, so no problem. So we look at this difference. By linearity, this is integral of fn minus f. And triangle inequality for integrals, this is the integral of fn minus f. which is not exactly what we have. But the, the elementary, so that's another lemma, a consequence of the triangle inequality is that if you do absolute value of A minus B, this is less than A minus B. I'm sure you all saw this in your childhood, okay, when you did analysis or 
right? It's uh, just a consequence of uh, uh, the triangle inequality for reals. So we can use that because we can say that this function is less than this function and take integrals by using the lemma. And this thing, we are told, goes to 0. So this difference here must go to 0, too, and we are done. Questions? Okay, so let's look at the converse. And here we are told to use exercise 20, which is helpful. And so uh, the notation is going to be what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use for, for the lower sequence, I'm going to use fn minus f in absolute value. And for the upper sequence, I'm going to use fn plus f. Okay? So this is my fn of exercise 20, and this is my gn. And there are other choices, I'm sure. Now, uh, there are 100 hypotheses to check before we can use uh, exercise 20, so let's do that. So we need to have everything in L1, which uh, uh, is true in this case, right? Because so uh, Fn minus F is in L1. Well, exactly because uh, Fn minus f is, is less than this guy, and this guy is in L1 as a sum of two functions in L1. So that's how we know that it's in L1. Then fn minus f converges almost everywhere to 0, because we know that fn converges to f almost everywhere. So if I do a subtraction, I get fn minus f converges to 0. And then I can take the absolute value, and it still converges to 0. So what property am I using? When I'm saying that it's something converges to 0, its absolute value converges to 0? The continuity of absolute value, right? That's all I'm doing. Okay, so this is true. Now, what else uh, do we want? We want the integral of f. Uh, yeah, we want the integral of g n to converge to the integral of g. So first thing, our f n plus f converges to two f almost everywhere. Okay, so that's my g. And this is integrable because f is integrable. Okay, this is in L1. And what else? Then I want my the integral of gn to converge to the integral of, of g. So the integral of gn is the integral of fn plus f. And that's integral of fn plus integral of f. And that converges to uh, 2 integral of f, which is, of course, the integral of 2f. Okay, so here I'm using my hypothesis. Okay, my hypothesis is the integral of absolute value of fn converges to the integral of absolute value of f, right? Because I'm proving the converse. So that's my assumption. We agree on that? I'm not using what I want to prove. 
okay, which is always positive. Okay? Good. So uh, with with all the hypothesis checked, we can say well the integral of the lower functions converges to the integral of its limit. Okay, and we are done. So because now by exercise twenty we have that the integral of fn minus f converges to the integral of 0, which is 0. And that's it. So that proves the converse. Yeah, without exercise 20, it's kind of tricky to do it. I mean, you, you really you need to use fat 2 twice. I mean, you need to do what's done in exercise 20. But it's a little uh, cumbersome. Okay, did I assign 22 to? I did? Okay. So 22. So let's look at the counting measure. New on the naturals. Okay. So what I'm going to do is first define what, what my counting measure is. Uh, so I take A included in the naturals, and I define nu of A as being the sum of 1A n for n belonging to n. OK, we, we need some mathematical definition of this way. OK? So if there are infinitely many uh, n's in A, well, I get infinity. If not, I get the cardinal of my set A, which is exactly what I want. OK? So now um, I want, what do I want? Yeah, I first ask you to prove a foreign formula that the integral of f with respect to nu is actually the series f of n. Okay, we need we need to know what the integral looks like uh, in order to to use uh, all the theorems uh, we know. So how do you prove a thing like that? Well, I told you use the the several steps, uh, three or four steps method. So step one. Take f to be the indicator function. Now, if you do the indicator function, you do 1a d nu. And that, by definition of the integral, you know that this is nu of a. Right? That's uh, how you do the integral. You do the constant, which in this case is 1, times the measure of uh, your set. That's how you define, we define the integral, whatever the measure is. So this is the definition. Now, nu of a, according to the definition of nu we gave, is this guy. So uh, what, what we're seeing is that for f equal 1a, the integral of f is actually the series f of n for f equal 1a. OK, it's the very definition. I mean, we're just using the fact that the definition of the integral is this, and then the definition of nu is this. But this is exactly the sum of f of n 
when f is 1a. So there is really nothing to do. Step two, you take f equal the sum of a i 1 a i for i equal from 1 to n. f d nu. So you r use the linearity of the integral. And you get this. And then this guy, according to what we just proved, is the series 1 a i k for all k. Now, because this is a finite sum and this is an infinite series, we can exchange the two. We did that already, and, and we know we're allowed to do that. It's just a question of uh, a finite sum of limits is equal to the limit of a finite sum. That's all we're doing. So, but do I, yeah. So, I exchange my two, and I get. this guy. But that's exactly f of k. Right? Therefore, the formula holds for f equal a simple function. Step three. Uh, yeah, the natural numbers start at 1. Okay, so, so it's the same thing. So theref therefore we get that this is, uh, so So the, the integral of f in this case is the series f of k. So that's proved for a simple function. Now step three, you take f positive and measurable, uh, but measurable, what we're doing here is the sigma algebra, which is you know, the maximum sigma algebra over possible subsets of n. Okay, when you're dealing with n, you can do that. So any function which is positive is going to be measurable. Well, any function is going to be measurable. That's, uh, that's, all. that's it. Since you are taking the whole for your sigma algebra, in this case, is all the partition of n, all the subsets of n. So you don't have any measurability problem when you, when you have a countable set. Like that. OK, so for f positive, of course, what we're going to do is use the, the increasing sequence of simple functions that converges to f. And what we do is we compute, we start with We start with f uh, as the limit as n goes to infinity of Cn. So remember, Cn is a, is a sequence of simple functions that increase to f. Which is the limit in n of the integral of Cn d nu. Which is um, the series because that's that's been proved already for simple functions. Okay. 
Okay? And... Okay, it's going to... And now I'd like to put my limit inside. And I'll be done. But here I have a problem, because I have an infinite sum and a limit. Okay, unlike what I had before, where I had a finite sum and a series, I could do it. Here I need to prove something in order to do this. Well, well it turns out to be easy in a case like that, because um, what you have is really a partial sum here, which is increasing. And you have this guy, which is also increasing, because the obsidian is increasing. So, uh, let's see. What, what this really is, uh, let's, yeah, I don't want to use, what this really is, is a supremum over, uh, let's use j, over the sum from k equal 1 to j of Cn of k. And the limit of this guy is also the supreme over n of this whole thing. Because remember, your limit is the supreme when you have an increasing object. OK, do we agree on that? And it turns out that you, you can exchange supremums. That's easy. Supremums are fine. And let's prove it. It's, uh, so we need a little lemma here. The supremum of over n, let's say, of the supremum over k of a and k is the supremum over k of the supremum over n of A and K. You can do that uh, because, let's see, how do you do that? Uh, you could say that the supremum, the supremum of A and K is certainly bigger than a and k. So let's be precise here. The supremum over k is certainly bigger than a and k for every n and every k. And then you take uh, on both sides, you take supremum over n of supremum over k of a and k is bigger than supremum over n of a and k. Right? And then you can take supremo over k on both sides. This side doesn't move, because now you're done. You have taken all your supremo. And it, so what you get is that supremum over n of supremo over k of a and k is bigger than supremo over k supreme over n of a and k. But this thing is symmetric. If we had started by taking supreme over n, we would get the reverse inequality. Therefore, we have equality and the lemma is proved. Uh, it's, be careful with these things, because if my a and k, for instance, is k over n, it's going to be very different if I first let n go to infinity and then k, or if first I let k go to infinity and then n. Okay, so limits are not exchangeable in general, but supremum r and infimum r too for the same reason. You, you do the same thing. Okay, so this is a little parenthesis. And uh, now we can exchange our two subs. 
So we do first sup over j and then sup over n of k equal 1 to j c and k. So, but of course the supremum over n is the limit over n because it's an increasing sequence that I have here. So I'll have f inside here and I can put it inside because I have a finite sum. So I get a finite sum of f of k and then the supremum over j is the infinite series. Again because this is increasing and so the supremum is really the limit. So this proves a formula for every positive function f. Okay. So now let's look at our different theorems. Uh, so for Fatou, for instance, tells us that the lim inf of f n is less than. this. But the integral we just proved is a series. So this is the series of lim inf of fn of k is less than the lim inf of the series fn of k. So it's, uh, these are statements about double sequences, and when you, when you uh, so, okay, I should be careful here. It, we are talking about the limit inf in n and the limit inf in n here, and we are summing over all possible k. Uh, thank you. Now, for the monotone convergence theorem, we need to have our f1 less than f2, less than fn. And so it's the sequence of functions which is increasing. It's not the functions themselves that are increasing. Okay, so some of you making uh, this confusion, uh, you need to set them apart. Okay, it's one thing to have an increasing function. It's another thing to have a sequence of increasing, uh, an increasing sequence of functions. Now, uh, so this means that for, for every k, we have this. And what the monotone convergence theorem tells us is that the limit over n of fn is equal to limit of fn. So in this case, it's limit over n of the series. And uh, they are all positive, of course. Same, same thing there. We need, for FAT2, we need our sequence fn to be positive. Well, that's exactly the lemma I just proved, that you can invert your subs. Because here you have a sub, and this is a sub. 
So there is nothing new really here. And the dominated convergence theorem tells you that if um, Fn is less than G and the G is integrable, which means that the series G of K is finite and Fn converges to F, then the series Fn of K converges to the series F of K. when n goes to infinity. So this in particular is a nice result for series. Sometimes you want to be able to take the limit inside your series. Well, the dominated convergence theorem uh, can give you an argument to do that. Okay. So that's it for the homework, right? Okay. Um, An application of, so still in the same section uh, of uh, integration, two point three, uh, there is a useful theorem in terms of applications which says the following. So you look at a function that goes from x with AB into R and A, A and B are finite. And you assume that your function which goes from x into R is integrable for all x in x. You define the function capital F as being the integral over all x of your function F. Okay, you have a measure space on your uh, on X. You have a measure on X. Now, uh, first result. Assume that there is G in L one of mu such that uh, F of x t is less than g of x for every t in a b. And assume that the function t 
t that assigns to t f t of x is continuous at t0, then capital F is continuous at t0. And second result, if uh, f is differentiable with respect to t, and if there is g in L1 again, such that the partial derivative with respect to t of f is less than g for every x and every t in a, b, then f is differentiable on a, b, and f prime of t is the f d t x t d. Okay. So when can you compute the derivative and uh, the derivative of the integral is the integral of the derivative. So it's very much the same theme of uh, putting your limit inside your integral. When can you do that? And it, you see that it's uh, very much uh, related to the dominated convergence theorem. Okay? There are quite a few hypotheses, but uh, it's almost better to uh, prove it every time so that you see what you need than uh, remember the theorem because there are you know, several hypotheses that you you need to check. But so let's let's prove it and you'll see it's fairly easy. Yeah, and the book has a misprint uh, at the end of uh, B of a theorem 2.27, which is this theorem, it's not f prime of x, it's f prime of t. There is no x. Uh, you are integrating with respect to x. So how do you prove something is continuous? Well, the usual way is to say, I'm going to take a sequence Tn in AB, such that Tn converges to T0. And I'm going to prove that f of Tn converges to f of T0. And that will prove that my function f is continuous at T0. So f of T0 is uh, this thing. F of t and x d mu of x. I call this guy fn of x. Okay, I define fn of x as being this thing. And now I say, well, but fn of x is dominated by g of x, which is integral. That's our hypothesis. So the dominated uh, convergence theorem tells me that when I do the limit of f of tn, I can, so this is the dominated convergence theorem, I can get my limit inside.
Okay, does this make sense? Now, I am also assuming that my function f is continuous as a function of t, which tells me that here this is f of t naught x. But you see, the, the hypotheses are completely natural. If you try to prove this, which is a natural way to prove continuity, you end up with, oh, OK, I want to put my limit inside. How do I do that? I have to have a bound for my sequence of functions. So that's one hypothesis. Second hypothesis, in order for the limit to give me what I want, I need to have continuity of the function inside. And therefore, uh, I get my f of t naught, and I'm done. For B, this time we take Tn going to T0, but Tn cannot be equal to T0. And we look at F of Tn minus F of T0 over Tn minus T0. We want to show that this ratio has a limit. If we succeed, we'll have shown that F is differentiable at T0, and the limit will be our derivative. So. We do this, and what we do is integral of f of tn x minus integral of f of t naught x over tn minus t naught, which is f of tn x minus f of t naught x over Tn minus T naught. Okay, just linearity of the integral, that's all. Yeah, and we, are, we uh, I'm probably stated that. Well, we need, of course, this function to be integral with respect to x for every t. So uh, this, now we, uh, OK, so this is going to be our fn now. Well, uh, yeah, I can call it fn. This is our fn of x, this ratio. And this ratio is equal to, by the mean value theorem, because this is a differentiable function with respect to t, is going to be df dt some xi x. For every uh, x, I am, I'm going to have this. Right? OK, that's the mean value theorem. And I'm going to take absolute values and use the fact that this is less than g of x, which is in L1. So again, the dominated convergence theorem allows me to put my limit inside. OK, so by the dominated convergence theorem, I have at the limit of this thing is the integral of the limit but since this is supposed to be differentiable in t this is my partial derivative this is the f d t at t naught x so that proves 
that capital F is differentiable and it gives me the value of my derivative. Okay? Questions on the, on the proof? So it's really write down what it means to be differentiable and make hypothesis the hypothesis that you need. That's that's what the theorem is about. In order to apply the dominated convergence theorem. Yeah. In, oh, this is a C, a creative one. I I uh, I'll admit to it. A C, the the. The X, uh, the Greek X. In tech, you just do slash C. You'll see what it looks like in reality, if you are curious. Yeah, I was traumatized as a child, so that's why all my printing is messed up. So other questions? Okay, so in order to convince you how useful this is, uh, let's do an example. Okay, uh, Fourier tr transform. So define capital F of T as being the integral of exponential i T x d mu of x. So I'm breaking my promise not to use complex numbers, but just for once. And let's assume that mu is a beautiful probability measure, which the only thing it is is me, it means that the total weight of mu is 1. Okay, mu of x is 1. Okay, so the function t, e, i, well, first, first thing we, we, we may need to, how how can I argue that this thing is integral? Because I take the module of it, and t and x are real numbers, so this has module equal to 1. Okay, it's on the complex circle, unit circle. Now, 1, because this is uh, a probability measure has an integral equal to 1. Okay? Therefore, this is integral. It's also, you can also write this thing, of course, as uh, cosinus tx plus i sinus tx. Erdos formula. And that tells you that this is a continuous function, undifferentiable, as many times as you want, in either t or x. But here we are interested in differentiating t. So uh, what we have here is that this is continuous in t, and This guy is equal to 1, but I'm going to write less than 1 in order to emphasize that I'm using the dominated convergence theorem. Okay, so uh, since the inside, so t uh, exponential i t x is continuous, so is f. Okay, that's an application of part A of a theorem, tells you, yes, 
if you integrate a continuous function, you still get a continuous function, provided you have a dominating function that we have here, because it's one. And your dominating function needs to be integrable, which is the case here. Okay? Now, second part, we can take the derivative of this thing. If we take the derivative of e i t x with respect to t, we get i x. That's what we get. Again, let's take the module of this thing. And everything has module equal to 1 except for x. So we end up with x. OK? Now, is this a proper dominating function for my derivative? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. We don't know whether x is integrable. It's going to depend on what type of mu we have. OK? So If x d mu of x is finite, then capital F can be differentiated, is differentiable, and f prime of t is, well, you take the derivative inside. So it's i t exponential, no, i x. i t x d mu. And I, f prime of 0 is then, um, if you let t equal 0, is then i x d mu. And that up to the constant i, this is the mean value of your probability law. And probabilists get really excited about that, right? Because you want to compute uh, means, uh, averages, of your distribution. Um, wh what's the point here? If you have a nice uh, Fourier transform, then the derivative of your Fourier transform gives you the value of a mean or but then you can do the second derivative and you get an x squared and so on over moments of your distribution. And in general, it's easier to compute derivatives than integrals. So that's why it's a useful formula. It's a useful way to do things because you keep computing derivatives and you get these uh, sometimes complicated integrals. Okay. OK. Our next and last co topic of the section is the relationship between Riemann integral and Lebesgue integral. Okay? But maybe we should take a little break before that.